Well, at the, uh, the very end of our last class, we were just finishing up on, you know, research that we do in, in psychotherapy. And I just wanted to add one more element to this because uh, I have been emphasizing how complex the process is of trying to, to do sophisticated research on what happens in the real world. Now, on page 323 in your textbook, so you'll notice this, they start talking about managed care. And I've just been uh, saying some things about managed care, fairly harsh things, uh, because most people who work in the mental health field actually believe that uh, and find that managed care has made it much more difficult to take care of people. And I want to point out a couple of reasons. First of all, there, there's a new player now that we didn't have before called a case manager. Now, I mentioned case manager as a concept back when we talked about psychosocial rehabilitation. Does anyone remember like what that case manager's role was in psychosocial re rehabilitation? What does the case manager do? Doesn't ring any bells. Okay. The case manager was the person in the psychosocial rehabilitation center who kind of oversaw the, the treatment of a person coming in. If you remember, I was telling you that the people who tended to come are coming from psychiatric hospitals. They've often had a long uh, history of mental illness. And they need many things. So the case manager became the person who saw that the person went to the mental health center for psychotherapy, uh, went to the mental health center uh, for medication, uh, that they found a, a place to live, that they developed some uh, job skills and went out for uh, job interviews. In other words, the case manager was someone whose job it was to oversee the best interests of the, the patient. The people, these were usually social workers and mental health workers, very committed to the care of the seriously mentally ill. And they had very complex responsibilities of seeing that the whole life of the person somehow got integrated. And these were people whose lives were very poorly integrated. Now, in, when we talk about managed care, the case manager, the same term is used, we're talking about a completely different person. The case manager is the person the therapist calls in order to seek permission to treat the person. Even though the person has insurance, uh, you can't just start seeing them in psychotherapy, at least in, 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 in a number of cases, a number of uh, situations where we're talking about managed care. More recently, I should add that some managed care companies now allow people to select their therapist and to, uh, and to start therapy without first getting permission. But up until recently, you always went to the managed care, uh, to the case manager, and then you had to tell that person after seeing a person for one session uh, what the person's problem was, why you think they need to be in therapy, and then the case manager would determine how many sessions to start with you could see the person. The case manager, uh, in the most outrageous one I can recall, actually gave a therapist two sessions, permission to see a person twice, and the person was acutely suicidal. But uh, in a minute, you'll see why that could happen. But uh, the case manager often may say, well, you can see the person for five sessions or 10 sessions. And if you want to see the person more, you've got to call the case manager back, and you've got to make a, a case, which means you've got to reveal a lot of personal information, perhaps, about the client you're seeing in order to convince this person, the case manager, that this person uh, should get treatment. Now, notice, when I talked about case manager in psychosocial rehabilitation, I was talking about someone whose job it is to make sure that the client or the patient gets all the services and help they need, and that is organized in a nice way, and that the, pr and the primary idea is that you will keep the person out of the hospital and help them to become a functioning person in society. In other words, the case manager is involved with the patient and their concern is about the patient. When we go to managed care, the case manager is not concerned about the patient. That is not that person's job. This is a person whose concern is with controlling 
the costs that the insurance company incurs because people want treatment. So this is not someone whose livelihood is dependent on uh, making sure that people get psychotherapy. In fact, as, as you can tell from their, their job, actually they may be seen as performing their job better by their employer if they deny a lot of benefits, if they keep people from using up a lot of sessions. So here we have uh, the case manager, and the case manager is very unlikely uh, to be a, uh, a mental health professional. Originally, it was thought that case managers might be nurses who would be very knowledgeable people, but instead, uh, many case managers today are people with like a bachelor's degree in business administration. So, so that's a problem that the person who manages the system has perhaps as a motivation rendering the least service possible, thus allowing for the greatest profit for the company. Now, there also are systems that have been developed that uh, also create this kind of difficulty uh, in the mental health world. We call, uh, one system we call a capitation system. Anybody know what capitation systems are? Had this in any of the other courses? Okay. What happens in a capitation system is a group of psychologists will agree to be the mental health arm of an insurance policy. That is a psychologist, and maybe may interdisciplinary, maybe psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, but a group will say, we will take responsibility for all the mental health needs of a certain insured group. So let's say this insured group has 20,000 members. Okay, the, the parent insurance company will then uh, say to this group, okay, we will give you $3 a month for every subscriber in this policy. So if there are 20,000 people in the policy, that means the group is gonna get $60,000 a month, or roughly almost three quarters of a million dollars a year, $720,000 a year. And, they're agree and that's up front. So they know they get $720,000. They don't get up front, but they get it in increments. But they get $720,000 this year. And they agree that they will take responsibility for all the people who are referred for psychological intervention. Now, you start thinking about this. It's now a business. You, the psychologist, are in business. And you already know how much money you're going to get. So one of the pluses in this, of course, is you already know the income from this, this agreement you've made. That is, you know your, your group will get $720,000 this year. The insurance company also, it's a good deal for them. They know our costs for mental health treatment this year will be $720,000. So they can figure this out when they're getting contracts with people. Now, in the absolute extreme, what do you think would be the best deal for the group of psychologists or mental health people who form this group? Sure, Mr. Inman. To not treat anybody? That's the extreme, isn't it? Make $720,000 and do nothing. Thus, what's the problem? It limits the therapist's motivation to mm -hmm. treat, effectively treat the client. Okay, it could. And that's the other side. It could uh, affect the therapist's motivation to treat the client in the sense that if you offer lots of sessions to lots of people, then you are dramatically cutting down the amount of money that you get per session per patient. So you don't know in the beginning how much you're getting per session per patient. Now, to do that, sometimes these groups will set limits. And they will say, well, we don't see people for more than 10 sessions. We don't see people for more than 20 sessions. Um, now, that's a real dilemma. Because as soon as you start thinking that way, you, you're going to lose at least a little edge on your ability to appreciate this particular person who is right in front of you with his or her problem today. Uh, and his or her problem may escalate into the problems of the spouse, and it may escalate into the family. There may be a lot of interventions you need to make. Every time you add one more intervention, you're cutting down the profit to your group. Uh, this is a dilemma. Now, 
there's, there's been so many studies, and by the way, there also tends to be pressure to think in terms of this year. So you know you're going to get $720,000 this year. So you look at the income for this year. Now there's a psychologist named Nicholas Cummings. Nick Cummings was the head of psychology many, many years ago. He's the founder, actually, of the psychology service uh, in Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente originally, it's a national corporation now, but originally it was a California-based uh, uh, insurance uh, company. And when Cummings became the, the head of psychology there, the head of all mental health, really, he put in a rule that we will treat everybody for as many sessions as you need. Now, he also did a lot of training to get people to understand how specific disorders might be treated effectively in a short period of time. But the rule was, we'll, we'll treat any problem, and we'll treat it for as many sessions as are needed. Now, what Cummings demonstrated was that if you had this openness to mental health care, that in the long run, and the long run turned out to be three years, that in three years, the total costs of health care will go down. That is, if you make sure that people who have psychological problems get seen by somebody who knows how to deal with psychological problems, the, the cost of health care will decrease. Doesn't mean the cost of mental health care will decrease, but it does mean the total cost to the the state, if the state is paying for this, or the total cost of the corporation, if the corporation is paying for this, will go down. Now, and by the way, the, it, when this came out, immediately there was criticism, uh, which uh, Dr. Cummings anticipated very well. First of all, people said, well, uh, this won't work with the poor. He'd already studied the poor. Didn't, socioeconomic status did not matter. Uh, race did not matter. Gender did not matter. Uh, he did this, did this across genders, across races, across socioeconomic levels. He proved no matter who you are talking about, if you have unlimited mental health services and you keep that in vogue for three years, the total cost of all of health care for that group will go down. Now you can see, in a way, why that, that would be, because for many people, if you can't get mental health care, but you can get health care, you'll go see your physician. And so your physician will have to render uh, this service. And so your physician will have to prescribe some medication or your physician will have to take a lot of time to sit and, and talk with a person. And the physician is certainly not going to be trained to do this at the level that, uh, unless the physician is a psychiatrist, is not going to be trained to do this at the level of a mental health person. So this is not a good use of that physician's time. And the person is not getting expert care but some insurance companies paying for it. Now, managed care still in, is, is you know, refusing to acknowledge these findings. There occasionally is a managed care company that has really paid attention to this research, and they are offering uh, people uh, very generous mental health benefits because they actually understand it's a good business decision. But you can bet that most of the people who are in these case manager positions are not in such a position. And so they don't authorize a lot of mental health care. But now you get your psychologist who uh, you know, is in a capitation system. Even for them, uh, if they think only one year, then one of their problems is they're going to have uh, to, to question how much service do we want to render for the money we're getting. If, I, on the other hand, they recognize that by treating someone you know, intensively now may prevent further episodes, then in the long run, they probably will do better if they treat everybody according to their need, as long as they got a big picture in mind. But, but that's a serious problem. And the reason why I'm telling you about this is because if you are reading studies about uh, you know, various kinds of interventions and how effective they are, you want to find out uh, was this intervention an intervention that people could be in until they were better, or was the intervention one that was time limited? Uh, and you'll find, if you read studies today, more and more, the intervention was time limited. And there are some interventions, while they are very good, don't work well in a, a time limited world. 
I might mention too, as you can, can tell, that managed care, of course, would also be much more interested in treatments that involve drugs than in treatments that involve psychotherapy. After all, you can see several patients in an hour and prescribe medication. Uh, you're only going to see one patient if you're going to do psychotherapy. Also, you don't have to see somebody next week uh, because they're on medication, unless it's someone who, let's say, is acutely psychotic and you want to see them very regularly uh, because you're concerned about how well they're, they're responding, or you may need to, uh, to make changes in the medication. But medication becomes a much more popular uh, therapy, even though the research I've been mentioning to you is, is showing more and more that while medication is extremely helpful for certain groups of people, it clearly is not especially helpful for other groups. And for people in psychotherapy, often it, it, there's not an added effect by putting them on medication. So you've got all of those issues, and those issues will cloud the real studies that are going to be done on psychotherapy. And so unless you understand that all of that activity is going on, sometimes it's hard to understand, like, why did the study turn out the way it did? OK. We're going to now shift, and we're going to talk about health psychology. Who knows what health psychology is? Or what's your fantasy about what health psychology is? Ms. Hofstetter. Health psychology, I think, <laughs> is, uh, you know, like learning ways to keep ourselves healthy. Um, it's geared towards, I want to say, self-help groups with weight loss and things like that. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, all of that is part of health psychology, but that's only part. But everything you described, indeed, would fall under the heading of health psychology. Any other things anyone wants to throw in as do you think health psychology is about? I'm going to have to assume people didn't read their chapter before. <laughs> oh. hmm? but Mr. Kim? <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so you're saying in the definition, and we'll look at it in a minute, I'll put it up for those who don't have it. But uh, yes, it, it, it's also studying illness and how people respond to illness. And actually, you're going to see it also deals with uh, you know, studying the causes of illness. Now, your, your textbook's definition has health psychology is a specialty that emerged in the 1970s. And it's devoted to studying psychological influences on how people stay healthy, why they become ill, and how they respond once they are ill. This is a definition that was developed by Shelley Taylor, who's a health psychologist. Now, the truth is, psychologists engaged in these activities long before 1970. But it was only during the, only starting around 1970, that the field began to organize itself. Uh, you know, the actual uh, roots, certainly, of some of this would go back to the veterans hospitals uh, right after the Second World War. Uh, if you went to a Veterans Administration hospital, almost every service in the hospital had a psychologist. And, and those who didn't wanted psychologists. That's why the Veterans Administration, if you recall we talked about this, spent so much money on training psychologists. You know, they paid your way to graduate school, they paid for your clinical training, because they wanted to hire these people. So in, in, uh, in the Veterans Administration, if you went on to the neurology ward, there was a psychologist. You went on the spinal cord injury ward, there was a psychologist. You went to the general surgery unit, there was a psychologist. Uh, you went to the blind center, there was a psychologist. The idea was that uh, there was early recognition that psychology played a very significant role in, in health care. But this was uh, kind of diffused and not organized. 1970s came, and psychology began to organize. It was very interesting. I remember going to some of the early meetings uh, of the Division of Health Psychology, which is one of the divisions in the American Psychological Association. It was always the most enthusiastic group of all the groups of psychologists, certainly, that I attended. There was tremendous enthusiasm for psychology getting into this bigger world of healthcare and not being identified 
solely with the world of mental health care, which is how many psychologists from my era were identified. That is, you were in clinical psychology, and clinical psychology was mental health care. Now, clinical psychology was, had new names and, and had things like clinical health psychology, which meant that you weren't going to limit yourself to the psychiatric unit in a hospital, but you were going to be in any unit where you might do well. And of course, uh, now, you know, it's certainly common. I mean, psychologists are in cancer centers and are highly valued there. Psychologists are in, in any good uh, aid center, of course. Uh, so there's, there's this growth of understanding that these psychological variables need attention. Uh, the journal Health Psychology also started about this time. Now, one of the things that contributed to why health psychology flourished and why there was such enthusiasm is the field didn't limit itself to just people who practice. Uh, if you look at the division of clinical psychology, for example, just about everybody who belongs to it is somebody who practices in some way. And if they don't, they, they are people who were trained to practice, but perhaps now they do research. But health psychology said, let's not only, let's not only bring in clinical psychologists, but let's bring in social psychologists who study many phenomena that are very important about health. Let's bring in physiological psychologists who have done all kinds of studies on health and behavior. In fact, let's bring in anyone who seems to have something to offer so that the field of health psychology would be a much broader world of psychology than the, the world, let's say, the clinical psychology had been or any of the other subspecialties had been. And now there was a, a landmark conference that I just made reference to but didn't talk about when we talked about national conferences called the Arden House Conference. And it took place in 1987. And it was, the reason why the, the Arden House Conference is important is it was the first really highly organized attempt by psychology to talk about what is health psychology. And, uh, and it talked about uh, health psychology from the basis of its study of variables that cause illness. Uh, it talked about what psychology has to offer to the, the treatment of physical illnesses. Uh, it talked about what psychology has to offer to the prevention of illness. And it began talking about the multiple issues that you get into if you're going to have to deal with these kinds of problems. For example, what are the legal problems you're going to get into? Uh, what are the funding issues you're going to get into? Uh, also, they, they talked about the fact that child health psychology is a different world than geriatric health psychology. So you need to look at populations and realize that you know, the causes of illnesses later in life are obviously different than the causes of illness perhaps in childhood. The risk factors in childhood are different than risk factors in later life, and risk factors became something that was talked about uh, much more often. Also, the issue became, uh, how are we going to train people to be health psychologists? I mean, here we're taking all these clinical psychologists, and we're training them in our universities, and we put them in our university clinic where they, they'll, they'll see students who are, are having difficulties. Then we'll send them out to the community mental health centers where they'll see perhaps more troubled people who are but having psychological difficulties or to the state hospitals where perhaps they're seeing people with profound difficulties. But all of this is, is you know, much more in the world of mental illness. Now, if we want to train people in the world of, of health, what's going to change? Well, the first thing obviously that became obvious is that people have to have more awareness of illness models. So it became necessary to, to say to psychology, you should train people in, in biological models of illness. Uh, we realized, of course, that was a very, very limited. So we started talking about uh, biopsychosocial models. Now, biopsychosocial models uh, really became the thing that people uh, focused on because it, it allowed you to understand that illness doesn't just come from your body. Uh, although some illnesses, your body's reaction is going to be a, the, the major determinant. But also, there are psychological and sociological variables uh, that can profoundly influence uh, the course of treatment and the course of getting ill. And 
uh, also, uh, you know, there was an emphasis too uh, that, you know, just your interpersonal life can affect, uh, you know, how you're going to do with illness. And so what happened was that we discovered there were a lot of disorders that fall under this rubric. And in trying to decide how people would be trained, we realized that probably psychologists should take more courses in neuroanatomy, in neurophysiology, uh, and learn about certain things about the disease models that I mentioned. That, of course, led to, well, if you're going to take all the training you get already in clinical psychology and you're going to add this onto it, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to have more required courses. The field struggled with that, but decided you should have more courses. Uh, we decided at that conference that uh, probably you can't get all the training you need by the time you get your doctorate uh, and you've had a number of practica and you've had a one-year internship experience. So a number of us got together and we published a paper a couple years later in which we outlined the training that one should have before one would independently practice health psychology. And what we said is you really had to have a two-year uh, postdoctoral experience. And, uh, and we felt that uh, now, that got changed to one year pre-doctoral, one year post-doctoral, but the idea was you needed substantially more training if you're going to be effective as a health psychologist, a clinical health psychologist, than you would have needed as just a clinical psychologist. Uh, now, and this is also where, you know, academia and the real world clash, because those of us who got together to do this, while we were all very much involved in health psychology and in the delivery of services to health psychology. We also were people who were running big services and we could afford to make, you know, uh, the statement that people uh, should undergo a uh, postdoc and that, uh, you know, we could fund them. But the reality was that was a small group of people. I mean, the, the big health world wasn't ready yet to fund all these postdocs. So even to this day, uh, there are a limited number of opportunities available to actually get the kind of training that ideally one would want to get. And we, you know, published this 20 years ago. And we're still trying to catch up financially with how do you provide the opportunities. And of course, a tremendous amount has happened in those 20 years, so that it's even more uh, striking now that once you get a lot of training. But uh, that's easy to say, not so easy to do. Now, <clears throat> In this model, the biopsychosocial model, uh, we know uh, that there are a lot of psychological variables that contribute, for example, to the onset of the severity of heart disease. I mean, heart disease is not just a biological phenomena. Uh, how you psychologically deal with it can make it much worse or can keep you from getting worse. We know there are all kinds of psychological variables in, in the development of ulcers in people. Uh, we know that asthma is very influenced. I mean, you, you get an asthmatic person who is under a lot of tension, and a lot of stress. You see many more symptoms than if they're not. Uh, stomach disorders. I mean, we know a lot now about stomach disorders. You know, people used to get a stomach disorder. They go see their physician. Now, many of the physicians are very sharp and realize there isn't a lot of medical attention this person needs, but boy, do, do they need some kind of psychological intervention. Uh, there's no question that uh, the way in which you approach having cancer, I mean, we, we absolutely have studies showing that people who are diagnosed with cancer and who become optimistic and decide that they can overcome this, even if they're unrealistic about it, uh, those people live longer than those people who say, you know, this is a death sentence and I might just as well get ready to die. Those people actually die much sooner. Uh, we know there are psychological variables and the pain experienced in arthritis. Uh, we know a lot now about headaches. And in headaches, we know that some headaches certainly, you know, have a physiological base. Uh, we also know that there are lots of headaches that probably are, uh, have a, a psychological base as the only factor that's causing the headache. And that psychological treatment is the most efficacious treatment for those headaches. And, of course, hypertension is very much affected by psychological variables. Now, even when you have disorders where there is no question, but this is a medical condition. Let's take someone's a paraplegic. 
I mean, their spinal cord is damaged. Uh, there's absolutely no question that, uh, that this is a permanent condition for almost everybody. But once you understand that, like let's say a person's been in an accident and they've had their spinal cord badly injured and they're going to be paraplegic and it looks like they're going to be paraplegic for the rest of their life. The physicians, you know, can stabilize the person and the physicians also can intervene if there are, there's pain and, and certain other problems and prescribe appropriate medications if they are needed. And, uh, and physicians can watch to be sure this person doesn't deteriorate in other ways. But now we realize that how somebody is going to respond, going from being a person who could walk to being para paraplegic, is going to be determined by psychologically how do they react to this trauma. That is, it's going to be the psychological interventions that take place after the person is stabilized that will have a tremendous effect. And number one, do they cooperate with all the people who are treating them? Number two, do they realize there's still a full life they can lead? Uh, number three, are they going to be really motivated to do things or are they going to go into kind of a, a chronic passivity uh, because they're confined to a wheelchair? So even though you would certainly see this illness as a, a medical illness and one that has to be medically treated, but we began to talk more about how much psychology is involved in so many of these areas. Before the development of an organized health psychology program, you did not see this nearly so much. Now, there are, are studies actually, and, and you hear people quote these studies a lot, that 50% of people who go to see uh, their uh, general physician, that is their primary care provider, have a psychological problem. Now, it, it's very interesting because that those data, when they're broken down, you know, change somewhat. There are studies that say that 50% of the people who go to see a physician have only a psychological problem. That is, you know, they come in with headaches and stomach aches, and or they come in with pains that would suggest perhaps they're developing ulcers, et cetera. But that there really is not yet a medical problem in the narrow sense of medical, uh, but there's a very serious psychological problem. There, those same studies would suggest that up to 75% of the people who come to see a physician have some significant psychological difficulty. That is, 50% of them might have no physical problem, but another 25% have a real physical problem and they absolutely have to see a physician. But part of that problem is determined by psychologically how they are dealing with it. So, I mean, a person may have uh, a real ulcer. I mean, this person really needs to see their physician. But at the same time, the ulcer is getting much worse because of the tension the person is living under, because of some of the habits the person has developed in terms of eating and other uh, behaviors. And if those, that person's behaviors were changed, then the person would not be nearly as ill as he or she is. Now, what's striking, if you talk with, uh, with older uh, physicians who are primary care physicians, uh, they have no hesitation in telling you this is true. I mean, they've been doing this long time. Uh, so many of these people are really, really sharp diagnosticians. And when someone comes into their office and begins describing things, they know very well that most of this problem is psychological. Uh, in, in some cases, they, they recognize it's entirely psychological. Or they recognize what part of it is really a medical problem that they should address and what part uh, is a psychological problem. The sad thing is that these are uh, people, some of the sharpest people, they, they've been doing this for 25 years. And in over 25 years, they've developed great skills with this. Still today, in our medical schools, we really don't teach our young physicians much about the psychology of people, nor do we teach much about how you intervene psychologically. And, you know, some of this is understandable. Uh, today, we've, we've never had more uh, evidence about physical disorders than we have now. I mean, our research on, on cancer, on heart disease, on uh, ulcers, on all kinds of diseases that you can mention. I mean, we've, we've never had all kinds of neurological diseases. I mean, there's a tremendous amount 
for a young person to learn in medical school. And they only learn a, a, a teeny bit of it. I mean, that's really why most of the people in medical school will do residencies when they finish and choose a specialty. So they will choose pediatrics, or they'll choose pulmonary medicine, or they'll choose going to a, a cancer center to study, uh, to be a resident, because that's what they want to work in. And they want to narrow down uh, their expertise. Now, in some of those rotations, people learn a little bit more about the psychological variables. But when they came out of medical school, uh, if it's a good medical school, they probably had a course in interviewing. Uh, and, but it's, but not every medical school would have that. And, uh, and the skill that they learn is minimal. They learn some skill. I think what I've noticed in medical school so often is that uh, so many uh, young physicians really have difficulty in taking a sexual history. Uh, you know, they're, they're just not comfortable asking people a lot about their sexual life, even though the person may be presenting uh, with an illness, uh, you know, directly related to their sexual activity. And so, and, and that's not surprising. I mean, people didn't choose medicine because they wanted to be psychologists. They chose medicine because they wanted to be healers of illnesses. Now we recognize that the idea of healing is a much broader concept than we once thought. It's not just a matter of doing surgery. It's not just a matter of prescribing medication. It's not just a matter of setting up a rehabilitation program. But it's a matter of a whole bunch of factors uh, that may involve surgery, may involve medication, may involve rehabilitation, may involve psychotherapy, uh, may involve, uh, may, uh, and may involve intervention socially. That is, uh, may involve seeing that the person gets job training and things like that that reduce stress that affect other disorders. Okay. Now, the, the, the issues then that, that come about for physicians is that they're caught having to diagnose things that many of them, especially in their early in their careers, are really not prepared for. So depression doesn't become for them the complex disorder that we have discussed in here. They see that somebody is depressed they run a number of tests. They know very well that all these tests are negative. You know, that this person doesn't have the things that the physician may have feared the person has. But the person does have some depression. The tendency, especially if you're working in a managed care system, then is to treat the depression. And if you're a physician, the most likely thing you will do is you will prescribe antidepressant medication. And now, what happens uh, is that, that that sounds like, well, that, that's logical. The problems are multiple from that point on. The first problem is it may be you don't want to cure the depression. As I mentioned to you earlier, the depression may be masking a far more primitive disorder. If the person stops being depressed, they, they may actually be worse. So tar going after the target right away is not always a wise idea. So that, that's one problem. Uh, but also, even if you prescribe medication, let's say the person basically is depressed, uh, and let's say that this is the kind of depression that actually will benefit from medication. And let's say the physician has very appropriately chosen the right medication, the right dosage. That doesn't mean that the patient will take the medication. We already know most people don't take the medication the way the physician prescribes it. So here we've got a physician who, who does everything right, but doesn't have a cooperative patient. Now, health psychology has become involved in trying to study that phenomena. I mean, how can we understand the so-called com you know, compliant or good patient? Like, how can the physician know, this person will do what I told the person to do, uh, and the person will get better, versus how do you deal with somebody who may not do what you told them to do? And, and, and this, this is where uh, things get complicated. So. For instance, if we look at this first slide here, you'll see this is what can happen when you prescribe, let's say, antidepressant medication for a person who is depressed. Uh, if the person is not motivated to look at perhaps some of the psychological, sociological, interpersonal issues that are, are factors in the depression, then the person may become very dependent on the medication because what they do is they simply take the medication and wait for it to cure them. 
So, of course, the next thing that comes in, so you, you don't overcome the depression because medication alone may not be a sufficient uh, you know, intervention to help. As I mentioned, you also have the, the issue, even if the, the medication is perfectly appropriate, the person may not uh, follow this. So what happens? Well, the person begins to, to function less well at work. May not be something, by the way, that's ever reported to the physician, so the physician is not in a good position uh, you know, to reassess this. Also, if the person continues depressed, you may get conflicts in their marriage. And also, you may get a worsening of a medical condition that the patient first presented. Because you can be sure if the patient is not taking the antidepressant medication that the physician prescribed, and, and let's say the physician also diagnosed something else and prescribed something else for it, the person's not going to take that medication either. And so you can get you know, multiple, multiple problems that have to be dealt with. Now, the field of health psychology goes much further than simply dealing then with psychological symptoms. And your text notes four important areas. First of all, the field deals with understanding how environmental stressors, psychological processes, social forces, and physiological factors interact to influence both illness and health. And, uh, and more and more in medicine today, uh, every specialist, but certainly people who work with in, in, in the world of cancer, the world of heart disease, the two leading killers in the country, uh, you know, will tell you that, that stressors really make a difference. Now also, psychologists are busy identifying risk factors for sickness, as well as protective factors for health. And Again, you want to remember, we'll talk about it, but th these are separate things. There are risk factors that can cause someone to get ill, and there are protective factors that actually help maintain or increase health. Then, your text notes that psychologists develop and evaluate techniques for promoting health behaviors and preventing unhealthy ones huge field, uh, you know, a field that is just uh, beginning to, to get the attention it should get. But the, the one uh, where, where you can see where the, the work of, of medicine, public health, psychology, sociology uh, has come together is in the issue of smoking. Uh, you know, we, we all know, uh, sadly, that that certain people will be prone to cancer if they smoke. Uh, if, if you uh, go to, to Europe, when you get off the plane, one of the first things that you are really struck by is, is are how many people there are that smoke. And if you're my age, you especially notice this because it used to be this way in the U.S., like it wasn't any different in Europe than it was in the U.S., but the U.S. has gone on this tremendous campaign to educate people it would be better if you do not smoke. Then, you know, we got even uh, laws passed, so you, you can't smoke uh, in hospitals, now you can't smoke in the university, or you can't smoke in most in, in restaurants anymore, depending what state you're in, uh, but more and more, there, you just simply can't smoke. Well, the environment has changed dramatically as a result of all of these different characteristics. By the way, when I was listing all the people along with, you know, medicine and sociology, et cetera, I should have mentioned law because, you know, it really has been legislators, often our lawyers, who have gotten these laws passed that have changed our environment. To the extent that you are at risk from, let's say, secondary smoke, even if you're not a smoker, to the, you are now much healthier living in this country than, say, if you were living in other countries. Uh, that's a tremendously important thing. That is, you know, you used to be a victim of, uh, of, the, of smokers simply because in most places people smoked. And so if you were in a, a meeting, there would be a lot of smoke in the air. Well, once the research was done on secondary smoke, all of a sudden there was really a change. 
And, and our world is a different world today because of that. Okay. Now, and, and so we want to identify how you promote health and also how we prevent uh, illness. And finally, psychologists are developing and evaluating psychological interventions that contribute to the effective treatment of illness. Uh, you know, psychologists were early in developing a biofeedback as a way to help treat headaches. And, and a tremendous amount of good work uh, has been done by psychologists in that world. Uh, psychologists also have done uh, you know, a lot of work with areas like hypnosis in trying to help people to deal with pain. Uh, that's not only psychologists who do that. Uh, there are fields, anesthesiology, for example, physicians in anesthesiology, some of them who you would think would be, and who are, they're very expert in medications and very expert in pain medications. But many of those physicians even have uh, gotten themselves special training in hypnosis, realizing that, that some people's pain doesn't seem to be treated very well with medications, and that, uh, that hypnosis actually is a more effective intervention. Okay, now then, we're going to talk a little bit about stress. And stress, as you know, it, is, it's the negative emotional and physiological process that occurs as people try to adjust or to adjust to or to deal with environmental circumstances that disrupt or threaten to disrupt their daily functioning. So it's the negative emotional and physiological process that occurs in people. Now, it's important to understand this about stress because there are, are people, you know, we say stress is bad for you. Stress is bad for you. I mean, that's, I don't think there's, it's not exactly arguable, but only if the stress is negative. For example, if you're getting ready uh, if you're an athlete getting ready for a big game and you're feeling what we might call stress, that is, you know, you're somewhat tense, you're excited, uh, this is very meaningful to you. Uh, but that adrenaline, if it's used right, may actually create for you the best set for you to go out and play the game. That is, you may go out there, you're very excited, you're very focused, you're very committed, and yes, there's a certain amount of, of stress but we don't tend to think of that in the same way as the stress you feel when, let's say, you're going to your job and you hate it. I mean, just the idea of going to work is, is a depressing thing. You, you begin to feel bad. Uh, your stomach gets tight. Uh, you notice you get headaches more often. That's the stress we're talking about. And, and we will try to make some distinctions, or I'll try to make some distinctions, so you realize that the, the, the stress that really is meaningful is this kind of negative stress that really causes serious problems uh, for a person. And that, uh, and when we talk about uh, you know, A-type personalities, B-type personalities, you'll see that there are some people who seemingly are stressed, actually they're excited. That excitement is not necessarily bad. Uh, but what is bad and is not helpful is the, the kind of overall stress that's debilitating, and that's what we really experience most of the time. Okay, then we'll pick up on that in our next class, and we'll really talk about some of the other exciting issues in health psychology.